I think we need to stop waiting for bureaucrats to have these global meetings and solve all our problems. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today is November 30th. I'm Eric Planey. I am Lucas Finko. Happy belated Thanksgiving from the Pirates of Clean Tech. Yar. <laughs> Lucas, how are you today? I'm very good. Uh, it's been an interesting month in Clean Tech News, so we have a lot to talk about today. It should be interesting. We do. We haven't recorded an episode in a couple of weeks, but I think part of it is we've been so overwhelmed with everything coming out right now. We needed the dust to settle a little bit in order for us to really kind of understand what has just happened in terms of what regulation, legislation, and of course, that little world conference that took place in Edinburgh. Uh, you know, we, we should have went over there and did a remote broadcast. Yeah, I know. There was kind of an information overload, so we took a little break. Um, you know, took some time to digest. And now you can get our opinions on the, uh, the most important news in clean tech. So you've come to the right place. Absolutely. So we're going to go right into the stories. But before that, we're going to do our wonderful disclaimers. The views and opinions expressed on the Pirates of Clean Tech by Lucas and Eric are solely those of ourselves and not any organizations we are necessarily affiliated with. And what's the second one? Oh, if we talk about any public companies or any public, uh, the underlying securities are not necessarily being recommended to either buy or sell from Lucas and I when we discuss about certain products or technologies from those companies. That's correct. Please do your own, your own due diligence. We are not uh, certified financial planners or analysts, and we do not make recommendations for stocks. So, absolutely. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Now that we got all legal mumbo jumbo out of the way, <laughs> you can go first. So our stories are a little bit, you know, uh, they've been out there for a little bit, but there's some really good ones. Um, the first one you have the option of either watching the video, I guess, listening to the video or reading the story. But I really want to take a second and give a full applause to CNBC. CNBC has done some great video pieces on clean energy recently, all the way from the 101s on wind and solar to this article from Magdalena Petrova on November 17th of 2021, entitled, Here's Why Battery Manufacturing Like Samsung and Panasonic and Car Makers Like Tesla are embracing cobalt-free batteries. This is an excellent video. I think the video was almost 20 minutes long, um, but I really went into it. Yeah, 18 minutes, 31 seconds. Yeah, It's a yeah. great video that's talking about the global supply chain for the manufacturing of batteries. It's talking about the fact that cobalt is, of course, one of the key minerals in existing lithium ion batteries that are in short supply. It's talked a lot about recycling of batteries, especially here in the United States as we're building that infrastructure. I believe this story actually even gave a shout out to a couple of companies that we know very well, one being Factorial Energy and the other one being Lifecycle, who we had on as a guest a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. But this is just a really good deep dive in understanding battery technology, all the materials and minerals in those batteries, where things are heading, and the fact that we are being better and better in creating new lithium batteries and new um, just overall different material batteries that could be really this the expansion of battery technology from you know uh going from solid state to lfp uh in understanding the different varieties of batteries and getting understanding on range totally love this article um yeah that's all i'm gonna go with lucas yeah i mean we yeah. do keep an eye on on battery chemistries and their impact on the environment you know they talk about here uh battery grade cobalt reserves are located in the democratic republic of congo which provides some, you know, geopolitical spice to this. Chinese investors control 70% of the Congo's mining sector. So this gets, you know, to the messy side of clean energy a little bit. So we do keep an eye on this. We are interested in better battery chemicals uh, that work better, are safer, cleaner for the environment, easier to acquire, cheap to acquire, cheap to refine, right? So we're definitely working on all these things. Yeah, and you know what? I'm going to just say it right now because I could see all the anti-green people coming out and saying the hypocrisy of the battery industry for, you know, all this abusive mining in yeah. countries with human rights issues, et cetera. Yeah. Well, don't forget, folks, that our gasoline has come from countries for the last 67 years wow. but also haven't lived up to the highest in ethical standards. <laughs> and you're still filling our gas tanks. 
So yeah. we're not going to have perfect solutions today, but we're going to strive to have better solutions tomorrow. And that's the important part about clean energy and the whole ESG ecosystem. Companies are getting more transparent because their investors are demanding it of them. So take a look at this one. Um, really just understand how batteries are going to change our lives and understand the materials that go into them. So shout out to CNBC on this one. Yeah, very cool. So this one is kind of the third act in what we were following and all of us were following in the clean energy space. Uh, this is from environmentalleader.com, November 19th, House Passes Build Back Better Act. Now, we all applauded the fact that a bipartisan infrastructure was passed by both the House and Senate and signed into law. It did not have as much as we wanted it to in terms of clean energy, but it was a fantastic start. Well, the House of Representatives last week started the second stage of that, which is signing the Build Back Better Act, uh, which included $555 million towards renewable energy and other sustainability goals. This article does a nice breakdown of what is in there, uh, if you want to scroll down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't looked at these articles in a week, so I have to kind of wake up <laughs> myself. But, uh, you know, we're talking about of the 555, 320 will go towards uh, clean energy tax credits. Uh, and talk about wind and solar implementation, energy storage, clean energy manufacturing, and EV. 110 is going to go towards clean energy technology and supply chains, which is really, really important here. We need the supply chain to be more domestic from a national security standpoint, from a cost standpoint, from an economic development standpoint. And then I think $105 billion is intended uh, to help resiliency, including uh, efforts to address uh, extreme weather. And, you know, you can argue certainly that clean energy and energy storage is part of the resiliency factor because energy storage means uh, potentially alternative sources of backup energy for companies and municipalities and cities, et cetera. Uh, and then I think there's something about another 20 billion for a loose change of clean energy procurement. Now, no, uh, we don't have any probability assigned to the fact that the Senate is going to pass the Build Back Better Act. We know that uh, the Democrats don't have all their senators lined up yet. Uh, a lot of money is being spent, according to Manchin and Cinema, But at the same time, I think something will get passed. And even if a lot of political pundits say a lot of the clean energy uh, facets do have some bipartisan support, and if you get past the noise of an election cycle next year, that some of this could even get stripped out and passed individually if the whole Build Back Better Act does not pass. So I think it's still a net positive. Um, this is something that all of your listeners out there should be talking to your Congress people about, sending emails, sending tweet, tweets to them, sending letters and encouraging them to pass this because this is money that would actually be used domestically to spur domestic clean energy uh, system and a better grid. So totally happy about this. Yep, I agree. So this is still outstanding with the Senate, like you said. So you can still contact your senator, ask them to support the bill, ask them to do whatever they can. Um, so you can still get involved. And yeah, we'd like to see this, this put through. This is the part of the bill, I think, that will have the most impact. So this is the important part. That's right. And you know what? Let's, you know, as, as 2022 goes further and further and this bill isn't passed, it's going to decrease the probability of it passing because every facet of it will be more and more politicized in a midterm yeah. election year. Yeah. Let's depoliticize clean energy and, and, and uh, smart grid development. Yep. Agreed. So good article. All right. All right. We are moving. Uh, another great, another great website, rechargenews.com. Mm -hmm. um, this one again is probably from a couple of weeks ago, November 19th by Lee Collins. A new six gigawatt green hydrogen project in Australia eyes ammonia export to Japan and Korea. Uh, just reading the subheadline, facility will combine about three gigawatts of wind, three gigawatts of solar with a desalinization plant and a 500 kilometer uh, hydrogen pipeline to a nearby port. Cool. This again is just one of those, exactly. It's one of those cool, cool projects where you're really kind of like, it's almost like taking that bag of Legos you had as a kid and you're just getting incredibly creative with that bag because you're talking about a green hydrogen project that's going to be used for ammonia export, something that you know most people would not have traditionally put together. Um, but is, ammonia is certainly needed. It's needed uh, for fertilizers. It's needed for, you know, especially in an island country and a peninsula country like Japan and Korea, respectively, where, you know, the amount of arable farming is not so great. So ammonia can go into fertilizers, et cetera. This is a really, really cool project. 
And I would have to say, I even saw something yesterday where BP announced that they're doing their own, I think, blue and green hydrogen project uh, somewhere in the UK. And I'm sorry, I can't remember where. Maybe we'll have that in our next week's uh, podcast. But green hydrogen is now becoming more and more reality as opposed to a lot of the conversation that took place over the last year and a half. And it's because of these kind of test projects that are really being creative and innovative and with their ultimate use of the hydrogen. Yeah, look at all these projects. 28 gigawatts Western, uh, 14 gigawatts Asian renewable energy hub, 8 gigawatt zero carbon hydrogen. You know, this is great. Look at all these projects. This is really good to see. So anybody that says, oh, green hydrogen's never going to (laughs) work. Here it is. It's working. It's working. And also, I mean, let's give a shout out to Australia. I think Australia had a lot of climate skeptics. Their economy had 25 years, almost maybe even 30 years of growth because they were exporting raw materials and a lot of their to China. They recognize that they can't have that as a sustainable way to grow their economy and not impact climate change. Given all the wildfires that Australia had two winters ago that were absolutely devastating, it is great to see that Australia and the Australian people have embraced a lot of these new green energy facets, including the green energy uh, system, uh, green hydrogen system. So look at this. Love it. Love it. Look at this nugget right on the end here. South Australia currently gets 62% of its electricity from wind and solar. So, you know, there are fossil fuel hit pieces out there right now saying this can't happen. <laughs> and it's right yeah. there. It's That's already right. it's already done. So That's right. Yeah. And think about this, you know, and think about green hydrogen as being this kind of excess capacity toggle as the US builds out its wind and solar, right? So if you have wind and solar being built out, but the rest of the grid isn't coming offline and you have this overabundance that could actually hurt the uh, market economics of the wind and solar, they can actually divert that into creating green hydrogen that can be used downstream in so many different applications. So look at look at green hydrogen as kind of being that toggle that helps wind and solar redevelop and get online. And it gives it another outlet of usage while we're trying to figure out the market economics of renewable energy on, and the impact on the grid. Yeah. This great stuff, great. huh? Yeah, this is a great article. I love this. I love when we tape in the afternoon and not in the evening because I think we have so much more energy. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. And I'm, I'm cooked up on so much tea. I'm like raring to go here. <laughs> I'm drinking a decaf right now, but that's only because I'm hepped on caffeine from earlier today. <laughs> I would like to sleep at least a couple hours tonight. Uh, I think I have one more, one more article. This is this Yahoo Finance, Elizabeth Colford from November 18th. Uh, and, you know, this one I had to bring up, focus. During uh, COP26, Facebook served ads with climate falsehoods and skepticism. This one just got the blood boiling, I have to say, because uh, I use Facebook. I'm on Facebook. I use Instagram. I'm on Instagram. But here we go that it looks like, you know, some false and misleading claims about climate change were being broadcast on the platform and they were not getting flagged by Facebook. And this was actually blurring the lines and taking away from all the good PR and press that came out of COP26. And that's what really gets me. That being said, I will say a lot of companies throughout the world use the two weeks of COP26 to market their own, you know, ESG initiatives, green energy initiatives. Most of those were positive and tangible, but of course, some of them were probably a little more PR than anything. But the fact that, you know, Newsmax with news using ads on Facebook calling man-made global warming a hoax, when the science has shut down that argument for so many years now, uh, I'm really disappointed in Facebook that they're just not cleaning up their act as fast as they can. Yeah, I mean, it just goes to show how how powerful these platforms are and how they can be used for good or for evil. So yeah, it's, it's a really powerful tool. And you know, it also goes to show how difficult it is to police it, right? Um, and so I'm a big believer in the First Amendment. I believe you defeat bad speech with better speech, right? So we also need to have, you know, more information provided so that people can understand that, yes, the climate science is real. Yes, we're polluting the commons. Um, yes, we need to change. So that's why we're here, right? That's what we're doing. Exactly right. It's it's a road. It's not a linear road. It's a road that's got, you know, hills and chasms and everything else, but we're on that road. So for people to spread false information to serve a really ridiculous political agenda, 
that makes no sense and doesn't even benefit their own listeners and readers in the long run, they should be ashamed of themselves. So, uh, you know, big pirates thumb down for Facebook on letting this happen during SOP 26. So I think those are my uh, quick, quick and to the point. Great articles. Lucas, over to you, man. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to start with this one. This one came from Janice Beecher. If you don't know her, uh, you can follow her on LinkedIn. She's very good. She works, she works at the um, Michigan, I think it's Michigan State. They have a utility policy institute. She posts a lot of interesting articles, at least one a day on utility policy. So this one caught my eye. I've been talking about this for a long time. So this is a perfect case study for, for what I've been talking about. This is uh, this article is from the Energy Institute at Haas, the little utility that could with a question mark. Um, so there's a small, tiny public utility in Kirkwood. And yes, that's the Kirkwood with the ski hill. Um, and what they did was they put in a giant transmission line. So here you can see the giant transmission line. Uh, and that giant transmission line had a large cost. And more importantly, it, ha- it has a fixed cost, right? So it doesn't matter if you use that transmission line or not. Um, that cost is there and it, and it stays the same. So it's fixed. Uh, the problem is they have a variable rate. So they have a rate that charges depending on how much you use. And so when the pandemic hit, uh, their consumption went way down and the fixed costs remained the same. So their rates had to go way up. So they went from, uh, what is this, uh, 13 cents to 70 cents, right? Which is crazy. So this is a fundamental problem with rate design that I've been harping on for years and that we cannot be paying for fixed costs um, with variable charges. Uh, This just seems to me an an obvious conclusion to come to um, with these situations. And so I I would even argue that almost the entirety of the distribution part of your bill should be a fixed cost um, because pipes and wires don't change their value whether you use them or not, right? So there should be no variable charge on the distribution side of your bill. They're not burning any fuel to provide you electricity. They just have pipes and wires. This was uh, sadly a case study um, of the pain that can happen when we don't align your charges with the costs, right, of utility service. Yeah, great article. You know, we, we I think it's smart for you to post these types of stories, and we try to, showing the fact that not everything is going smoothly in terms of the energy transition. So we have to be cognizant about these problems and to figure out ways to have better solutions, all right? And, like, obviously, the answer is to match uh, revenues with costs and they have more of a variable cost model uh, that can somehow be passed on to the consumer so they have flexibility and they don't get rammed with fixed costs being dispersed over a smaller group of people. Um, so it's, it's, it's not easy to come up with these solutions, but something has to get done. And uh, let's hope we move forward with something better. Well, I think you make a good point too. I think this is critical for the clean energy transition. If, you, if your bill obfuscates the costs of the grid, then you can't make the right decisions, right? You can't see that putting solar panels on your roof uh, helps you, right? Because the charges that you're being charged with don't align with the true costs of providing you the service. So we, we need more clarity on the bill. You need to be able to understand what's going on on your bill, right? And we can't have these, oh, we'll just bundle everything and then charge you some random number that you don't understand, right? That, that's not helping anybody. We need clear charges of this is what these things cost you. And if you want to avoid those, you know, this is what the amount is. So we, I think we need that for the cleaner energy transition. So yeah, I'll get off great story. Soapbox. Great story. Uh, it's a great find. Yeah. So that was a good nugget. So this also from CNBC. That's funny. We have two NBC, uh, CNBC articles. Construction starts at America's first major offshore wind farm. Uh, people, people like myself have been waiting for this for decades. Don't know why it's taken so long, but it's finally happening. Yes, you could say we already built wind farm, but it's um, the Block Island wind farm. I think there's five turbines. It's only 30 megawatts. It's not major. So major here. So thanks, uh, and Mark Frangol for this it's from November 19th. So here's the Block Island wind farm. That's that's about it. So the new wind farm is going to start construction it's 800 megawatts so that's what um you know 20 times bigger 25 times bigger it's off of um cape cod and martha's vineyard 
right? It's going to start sending power to the grid in 2023. So finally, we're joining the rest of the world in harnessing offshore wind. Yay. Time to celebrate that one. Yeah. Listen, I think this is a great article you brought up. Um, I love this for a couple of reasons. First, a little bit of perspective. 800 megawatts roughly is about three or four coal plants on average size. So that in itself is significant. Secondly, what I really like about this is if you recall, the whole Cape Cod area wanted to do offshore for a long time, but a lot of people resisted because they didn't like the visual of the wind turbines. But the same group of people, in my opinion, have now realized the benefits outweigh the, the risks of not having offshore wind and renewable energy on the grid. So they've accepted it, they've adopted it, they've come to a compromise. And the third thing I would say is we have had a lot of articles over the last couple of months that have talked about the fact that new technologies are going to be able to push these further out in the ocean, which means more power, more size, uh, less visibility to the naked eye from the beach. Uh, and it's just a win-win for everybody. You know, floating offshore turbines are going to be the next big thing. All this technology is being developed. So this is a great win, great article. Let's keep going. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So I was very, very happy to see this. And I hope it is followed up by 10 more projects like this, which I know are in the planning stages and we saw in the Princeton study, right? So I'm hoping to see more. Okay, so I have to have a utility dive article every, every episode. <laughs> um, Come on, sponsor us, utility dive, sponsor us. I know. This is a dive brief from the earlier bill, the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that had funding for EVs, transmission, and hydrogen. This was published on November 8th and updated November 16th from Ethan Helen. I wanted to get in, I found it so hard to find out what was in the bill. I actually downloaded the bill, read through the table of contents. That was the only way I could really find out what was in there. But this article does a really good job of summarizing um, what is actually in there. So we can go into some of the details here. You have 65 billion for grid infrastructure. You have 50 billion for cyber and climate resilience. Uh, this does not have the clean energy or the clean power plan, which, which we talked about in your um, article, but it does have some, uh, yeah, see, so they mentioned that here, the reconciliation bill, that was the one that you covered, which is still outstanding. So let's see what else is in here. Um, a four and a half, uh, sorry, two and a half billion dollar revolving loan fund for the DOE. That's our friend um, Jigger Shaw, right? I think he runs that one. Uh, Six billion dollar cost share program support grid reliability R and D, which is great. Facilities like Enrel um, are are supported by that money. <coughs> Demonstration projects, five billion dollars to grant programs for utilities, states, and tribes bold in faces of extreme weather, wildfire, natural disasters. Uh, what else is in here? Seven and a half billion to set up a national EV charging system, which has been on Eric's list of things to do. So this this bill's already signed, so that that money's going. Five billion for electric school buses. I just saw a great article somebody sent about uh, electric school bus have been performing fantastic. They haven't missed a day yet, um, so that's great to hear. Six billion for battery processing grants and battery manufacturing and recycling grants, which will help out the other article that we, that we just mentioned. Eight billion to set up at least four clean energy, uh, clean hydrogen hubs. Six billion for subsidies for uneconomic nuclear power plants, which we still need nuclear power. I was saddened to see Germany's shutting down some nuclear power plants today. That's not good news. Those are zero carbon, essentially zero carbon output, large power plants that are base load power. They're available 24 seven. I believe we have to have them. Three and a half billion for four hubs for removing carbon dioxide from the air, which is glad to see us finally joining that club uh, and taking care of our mess in the atmosphere. And 2.1 billion for a loan program for carbon dioxide transportation. Okay, that was a lot of talking. I'm gonna pause now for Eric. No, you know what? Uh, well, first of all, let's be a little more clear because it's confusing everyone. Uh, this is from the infrastructure bill, the one that has been passed and signed into law. So this is great. Uh, the article I referred to a little bit was just the the what the House has passed in the Build Back Better, which is the, the kind of the more social welfare bill that is a bit more controversial. Um, although my article did refer to a little bit of the infrastructure bill as well. Um, I do think this is great. The one thing I'm gonna have to say though, because there's a lot of scrutiny, especially from the cynical people who don't believe in clean energy. I think we really have to hold the government accountable to see how every dollar is spent utilizing this legislation. Because I really wanna build out clean infrastructure 
But what really prompted me to think about that was the VW Dieselgate settlement money went to so many states and that money was supposed to be used to build out a EV infrastructure. Right. But then you don't really hear much about where that money has been used or how it's been utilized. Right. Nobody's following up on it. So, you know, now we have duplicative money being spent on building out a national EV charging infrastructure, which I'm all in favor of. But again, I think we have to really have a watchful eye and have some government watchdog groups making sure this money gets spent correctly. I'm all in favor of it, but I want to make sure we do things to the absolute best practice possible. Yeah, agreed. So, yeah, it's my understanding that the outstanding bill has a large amount of money for a kind of carrot and stick approach to the directly to the utilities. So if they meet clean energy targets, I think it's like 4% a year for the next 10 years, they get a large reward. And if they don't, they get a large penalty. So that could have, um, that could be a very large motivator. I, I worry that some of the implementation might be difficult, but um, that would be an amazing way to push clean energy into the forefront. Again, I don't think that targets 100%. So it's not going to be hugely costly uh, to the consumers. So we're still looking to see that bill come through. So Awesome. Well, a lot of good stuff here uh, in this jam-packed article by Utility Dive, our good friends. So, yeah. Oh, those are your articles? We're done? Yeah, we're all done. I only had three, so. Wow, we packed in a lot. But I'll tell you what, they're great stories. Um, you know, we're really happy. The last month was totally eventful with the passing of the Infrastructure Act. Stage one of Build Back Better in the House, COP26. I was slightly disappointed in the actual tangible results of COP26, um, but the two takeaways are, I think we did move in the right direction from the UN being organized. Um, I think there was a lot of focus on the small island nations, especially in the Southern Pacific, that are really worried about the impact of climate change and supporting them. So I think that's a good thing. Um, you know, but in general, there was also a lot of good PR that came out of companies, you know, just taking it upon themselves to have some PR and some good initiatives being announced during the period. So win-win I for mean, everybody. I did want to talk about uh, COP26 a little bit. You know, I was I was disappointed in it, just like many people are. I think a lot of people came out of there not happy, you know, maybe even depressed. And I think my response to to those people, if you're one of those like myself, Here's what I would say. I think we need to stop waiting for bureaucrats to have these global meetings and solve all our problems. Uh, I think we have to give up on that idea altogether. What I would invite you to do is to look at what you can change, right? Yep. So a lot of businesses and industries say, oh, well, people demand the fossil fuels. So we're providing fossil fuels. So you can make choices in your life right now not to consume fossil fuels, right? Not to burn fossil fuels and release them into the air. Um, you don't have to drop everything right now. You can make small changes. As long as you make small changes every day, then we'll get there together. So I, I like, I want to promote that message of empowerment and personal responsibility, right? You are empowered to make changes in your own life, in your own business. You can go into work and say, hey, you know, this supplier we're using can we find a cleaner supplier? Can we find a sustainable supplier? Ask those questions, right? Everybody can do that. As long as we make tiny changes every day, um, we'll get there together. So I'm sure there's a thousand things you can do. You can do an internet search of your choice to find a list of ways that you can help the clean energy transition right now. Um, yeah, so I invite you to, to do that, to make changes in, in your life. You know, I... I'm going to make the decision to remove our natural gas uh, heater, water heater, right? Uh, before the end of its life, we're going to do that. And we're going to switch to electricity so that we can get cleaner as it get, gets cleaner. Um, so that's a choice I can make. That's a decision I can make. Uh, and I'm going to do that. So I invite you to make similar choices. I, I own an EV. You know, you can make that choice also. I know it doesn't immediately make everything clean, but it allows electrification, which allows our grid to get cleaner um, over time. So these are choices you can make in your life. You know, I've said like, if, you, if you're if you in a two car household, one of them can be an EV, you know, and you can take the other one on long trips. That's entirely feasible. And if we got everybody there in 10 years, 
we would be in a fantastic spot, right? So, whew, that's You're it. Okay. Box. Yeah, I feel better. Look, I I agree and disagree with you. Uh, I, I was slightly disappointed in COP26 too. But I think the overall momentum and direction by the global geopolitical community is heading in the right direction. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, I think the guy that had the right idea maybe about 10 years ago was Mike Bloomberg when he was mayor of New York, because I think his attitude was it's not going to get done at the national level, but mayors, especially the mayors of the 50 largest cities in the world, have a lot more power and influence to implement change in high density, high population density urban centers. And so I think mayors and in the U.S. governors have a lot of power to promote change. And I look at a state like Colorado, which has a lot of red voters, but are all such caretakers and stewards of their environment that they push the utilities there and they push the government to have as green of an agenda as possible. And there's been some good news coming out of Colorado, you know, incrementally and also in, in kind of large scale. So people, you know, I think on the big picture, it's moving in the right direction. I think you're absolutely right. We cannot be hypocrites, though. We have to be doing more individually as individuals from, you know, recycling a little bit more, making sure that your recycling is actually ending up in the right spot at town council meetings, switching to, uh, you know, your outdoor power equipment to be electric and not gasoline, uh, something I've been a big proponent of. Right. Those little steps are absolutely there. I don't own an EV yet, but I just bought a hybrid, uh, a used hybrid, Subaru, <laughs> which I, I'm getting about six miles to the gallon more than my wife's Subaru, uh, <laughs> you know, for the roughly the same car. So that's beneficial. And one day I'll finish my EV conversion project. One day. Yeah, um, you do have an EV. Yeah. It's just not done. I, well, yeah, well, I have a broken EV in the garage. Uh, <laughs> that counts. So that will be recycled. But yeah, well, Lucas, what you said was I do absolutely agree with. Um, I think the UN is doing its best to make sure people are moving in the right direction. And what I like about President Biden and what he's done with the infrastructure bill, really a bipartisan bill, is it's easier for the US to dictate to countries like India and China that they need to step up their green game when we ourselves are doing the same. Yeah. And I mean, if you, you know, well, I don't want to get into it. We can move. <laughs> It's been a great week. It's been a great week. Uh, I think we're going to get back to having a guest. Maybe uh, we'll have one guest before Christmas. Uh, yeah. First off, it's a little bit early this year, it seems like. So happy Hanukkah to our friends celebrating Hanukkah. Yeah. Uh, it's a great holiday season. Let's take this time to cherish the world we live in, cherish our loved ones, and just enjoy life to the fullest and make sure everybody stays safe and healthy over this holiday season. Yeah. Have a have a happy holidays and we'll see you soon. Yeah. So with that, uh, I'm Eric Planey. I am Lucas Finko. And we are the festive Pirates of Clean Deck. Yar. yar. Ho ho ho. Oh yar. Oh yar. Yar ho. <laughs> ho 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 yar. <laughs>